Indian uh, Dialogue, Science, Scientists, and Society. Uh, as many of you know, uh, about a year ago, uh, the Indian Academy of Sciences started its uh, latest uh, publication uh, uh, called uh, Dialogue. And this is a publication that's somewhat uh, uh, different from uh, many of the other publications that the Academy has. Uh, it's an online uh, journal. And uh, it's, it's uh, not devoted to uh, some particular branch of science, uh, but it's, 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 pro it's dedicated to uh, promoting a dialogue between scientists, uh, introspecting on the practice of science, as well as the connection of, of uh, uh, science to society. And you know, uh, this, this latter uh, interaction is, is diverse has many dimensions. And, and so the, the purpose of the journal is to promote uh, a discussion of uh, diverse aspects of social interactions, ideas, um, et cetera, that in some fashion involve science. Um, this, um, so, um, and as part of this journal, uh, there's sort of, sort of two additional components that have been sort of conceived as, as, a, as, a, as parts of a whole. Uh, one is a web platform called Conflu Confluence, uh, which is a, a, a more free format, informal uh, interaction forum as compared to Dialogue, which is a peer-reviewed scholarly journal. And uh, in addition, uh, we uh, also have uh, <coughs> a, 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 a planned a series of outreach activities, uh, such as this one, where uh, in addition to sort of communication in writing or, or dialogue in writing as well as through, through interactions on the web, uh, we continue to uh, pursue uh, interactions and dialogue in the old-fashioned way where people come face to face and, and talk to each other and, 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 and engage in other activities. And over the last year, we've had a number of such, uh, such events. And uh, as of today, we are sort of completing the first year uh, of activities, I think October 13th last year was when we had the launch of the journal. And uh, so now, in some sense, uh, today's event is, is, is the beginning of our, sec uh, of our new year, uh, the second year of existence. And, and uh, <clears throat> uh, so in, in um, uh, uh, marking this event, we, we are having today's symposium, uh, which will pursue some of the themes that have been uh, explored through all of the activities that I just mentioned. Uh, we have three distinguished speakers today. Um, uh, one is uh, Professor uh, uh, Ramesh uh, Bemazai, uh, who <coughs> has been, I'll, I'll give a more detailed introduction. Um, uh, he has been Vice Chancellor at the Mata Vaishnadevi University in Jammu and previously uh, been at Jawaharlal Nehru University and the Banaras Hindu University. And he's going to tell us about uh, how pursuing science and research is different from other careers, uh, from his personal uh, experience and perspective. Um, the second speaker we have is Professor Arvind from uh, the Indian Institute of Science Education and Research in Mohali. And uh, uh, so uh, where he has been since its uh, inception. And he's going to talk about uh, the ICER experiment in science education. Um, and and uh, lastly, we have uh, Professor Rajeshwari Raina uh, from Shivnadar University. And, and uh, she's going to tell us about, uh, uh, well, her, her talk is titled uh, si Living Soils, Science Pedagogy, Practice, Policy Questions. And uh, so um, that, that, as you see, um, uh, the three talks, uh, cover sort of some of the many different aspects uh, that could be form of a, a science society uh, dialogue. That, um, and and uh, so let me start by inviting Professor Bemazai. Uh, as I already mentioned, uh, he has uh, been at uh, the different institutes I mentioned. He obtained his PhD from the All India uh, Institute of Medical Sciences and served as a faculty member uh, at, at uh, BHU and then at the Jawaharlal Nehru uh, University, uh, where he was, among uh, other things, uh, dean of the School of uh, Life Sciences, 
and the School of Computational Int and Integrative Sciences, uh, etc. Uh, he's had a very distinguished uh, research career uh, sp uh, spanning many uh, uh, activities, uh, in, including bioinformatics, uh, and, and he's uh, guided a large number of uh, research scholars as well as students at the universities where he has served. And, and uh, uh, he's also uh, uh, had many roles that he has played uh, as uh, uh, in institutionally, uh, including, as I mentioned, being vice chancellor of, of the uh, <coughs> uh, Mata Vaishno Devi University. Um, and his work has been uh, recognized in various ways. I won't read out all the details, um, but uh, uh, let me mention that these uh, recognitions include a Padma Shri uh, in, in 2012. So without further ado, let me invite Professor Bemzai to share his perspective on how uh, pursuing science and research is different from other careers. Thank you. It's okay. Well, my dear young friends and colleagues, a very good afternoon to all of you. You heard that why we are here, so I need not repeat that. And what I'm going to speak on, it's already there as a slide. As youngsters, I know at this juncture when you study in the college, you're at the crossroads and you say, what, the, what is the career in science I'm going to follow? Or what is the direction I'm going to take? And this lecture is designed to highlight those aspects so that you are persuaded with the opinion that the decision you have taken to be in science and pursue research, hopefully in future, is the right one. And I'm going to highlight those reasons that why should you be there in science and why should you take research as a career option. Although in today's world, even in India, you have a lot of options as I have put over here. There has been a paradigm shift in the past decade and you have a number of careers. Even the mental makeup or the thinking has changed over the years. And this has changed because now students take risks. They can have their own startups. They can have their own entrepreneurial uh, sort of steps they take. Or they can establish the shift jobs so quickly. And the students from engineering, medicine, go into all these startup businesses or entrepreneurial skills if they have. So since the paradigm has changed with respect to the career options in India, the question is, if we are in science and we want to pursue research, is this the right choice for our future? It turns out, and I'm going to justify that, that yes, it's the right choice. And the reason being that even if all professions are rewarding, and they are also, in terms of uh, good living, they provide that good living, but the kind of satisfaction you're going to get out of uh, pursuing the research is enormous. And what is, what is the ingredient which is required is passion. And that passion comes out of the involvement in investigation. And research is an area where you get in so much involved over a period of time, once you're in it, that you become passionate about it. And whatever you would, you would agree with me, all of you, that whatever you're passionate about, once you become passionate, for something, whatever it is, you will excel. And what is required in science? What is required in research? That you contribute excellence to the area you're involved in. And what is the ingredient required? That you are passionate about that. So right in the beginning, I would say that the first lesson which I'm trying to sort of give or the carry home message for you is, that once you're passionate about your subject area and the research you will follow, you will achieve excellence in that in due course of time. The last 
what I'm giving you an example of is in 1819, the, although it's not very clear over here, this particular painting which was drawn, although there are a number of pa painters who have been acknowledged all over the world, and their acknowledgement, even if it started from 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th century, it exists till today. Now, the painting was drawn in 1819. What was the purpose behind it? it it's called Raft of Medusa, and it highlighted the agony of those who survived and were thrown to the seas to survive for themselves. And when the painter drew it, the painting was done, it stands till date. Why does it stand till date? Because it was a masterpiece. So were the masterpieces created by different painters, including Van Gogh, and who are famous for those paintings. Similarly, in science, once you're passionate about your science, once you are involved in research, and you understand the fundamentals of that, that becomes basic, obviously, any subject you're involved in, then you contribute and you excel. So you have to create masterpieces out of what you are involved in in research. So pursuing science and research makes you think differently. Now, this is the first carry home message, because we don't think like a person, I don't say that I'm not undermining all the professions which are there, because all the professions contribute equally to the growth of society. But I'm convinced at my level that whoso pursues science and pursues research thinks differently. The whole mental state is very different, analyzes very differently. So we, as scientists, we are not here to eat, make merry, survive, and then reproduce. What we are here for is to think differently. Since I'm a biologist, I thought, let me pick up an example. And I picked up an example of biodiversity around us. Right from microbe to humans. The diversity we have, a scientist is going to a researcher who, you are a science student, and many of you will follow your, you will get into research in due course of time, if you follow this paradigm, you're not going to look into biodiversity from a common man's point of view, looking at it and then saying, well, this is bacteria and this is human. You're going to ask questions about it. There are many questions unanswered for biodiversity. And one of the, you know, one of the threads which connects biodiversity is evolution. So you're going to see the biodiversity from evolutionary point of view and understand it then we are you are going to pose many more questions to understand this biodiversity, the bountiful nature which is around us. So as a scientist, you're going to think differently. So obviously, pursuing science, it makes us think differently because we do not emphasize too much what, on what is obvious. The biodiversity to a commoner is nothing more than an insect around here or a bacteria around there. But for a researcher, it pushes the researchers to think differently. Why is it so different? Why is this nature around us so different? How do they communicate with each other? Is there a relationship within this biodiversity in this ecosystem which sustains them? So you start asking those questions. And then you'll go deeper and deeper and say, oh, what is there as a common molecule which binds them together? And you'll say, oh, DNA is common to all of them. Then why is it that this DNA is different in a microbe and this DNA is different in the human being? And all the human beings, why are they different? So you start asking questions. And once you become passionate about those questions, you excel. You will contribute. You will innovate. So you do not do what is obvious to you. In the diversity or biodiversity, then you will ask this question. You'll say, oh, there is inter-individual variations between humans, between animals, between plants. Within the Drosophila, I also, there is a difference. So that means there are intra-differences, there are inter-differences. And what is behind these differences, I already mentioned that in evolution, there is some molecule which connects them all. And you would like to understand it on the basis of that. And it becomes very important. In today's perspective, if I have to jump the gun and I have to say, is there DNA molecule structurally which is responsible? I'll say yes, 
partly. But there are many other epigenetic tiers to it at different levels which will make it very different and then you will become different from one human being to another human being, one animal to another animal, and animal and human being. So what is the carry home message? Which is the first message in my lecture to motivate you is that being in science and research breaks monotony. So you are not involved in a job which is you know, parroting the same content in different paradigms or you are, in a, you are in a comfort zone and then you sit there all the time or you are chained to a monotonous job day in and day out, morning, evening and it's the same thing you're doing. You're not doing that. So being in science, being in research breaks the monotony. And that's very exciting. In fact, what would breaks monotony if you're, you are here today and tomorrow it's totally different question you are addressing or where you failed and you want to achieve success in that on the, on the day which is coming. So it's, it's definitely motivating. So you, the first lesson is it breaks monotony. How does it break monotony if I have to take the same argument further? I gave you biodiversity profile and I told you what questions a researcher can ask or anyone who is in science can ask. And the fundamental to that was the connecting thread was DNA. Although I said simultaneously that the DNA alone does not explain all the differences which will be there from microbe to human because there would be functional differences also. How would those functional differences come beyond the structural differences in the DNA molecule? So that becomes a complex question. But keeping it simple for you, so DNA, all of us sitting in this audience have 3.2 billion let alone DNA in our 100 trillion cells all of us have. So in our, in our 100 trillion cells, we will have two kinds of genomes. One will be the nuclear genome, which will be contributed by mother and father. And of course, father to the males will be contributing Y chromosome. And we'll have mitochondrial genome, which mother will be passing on to both daughters and sons. Now, in this genomic material, two genomic materials, there are going to be changes here or there which have happened in evolution from time to time. And those changes have become important to understand. There seems to be those changes which I have put over here. These are single base changes. If there, are, if there is a 3.2 billion let alone DNA approximately, now, along the length of that DNA in our nucleus, you're going to have randomly changes here or there. And this three billion letter long DNA will have this language of alphabets, four alphabets, which we call bases, based you all are familiar with it. So these base pairs, they will create landscaping features like landscaping features you see over here. You see mountain, you see big trees, jungle, sparsely distributed trees and rocky areas. So these are all landscaping features in nature. If you see, look outside, you'll have all these trees over here, garden over here, building over. These are landscaping features. Similarly, these four letters along the length of three billion letter long DNA has given rise to landscaping features which we have named them in different uh, jargons. You don't have to bother about that. So we cannot, they cannot replace each other. They have their own distinct identities. So in this 3 billion, 3 billion let alone DNA in nucleus and 16.5 kilobase DNA, that means 16,500 odd base long mitochondrial DNA, you have changes in nuclear DNA at 100 base or 300 base level, you will have changes from one to another person. So it gives you a message. Oh, these changes are happening from you to me. They can be there at, at, at every 100 you know, letter interval or 300 letter interval, these changes will happen. And what are these changes? It turns out these changes can be single changes. These changes can be some insertions, deletions. These changes can be block substitutions, inversions, copy number. Not going in the details, the idea it gives us that the three billion letter long DNA in our 
100 trillion cells in the nucleus, in all of us, we have these variations from here to there. Now, these variations become handy. If I have again to jump the gun, they become handy to map the genome, unknown gene I can map. Because if I had to reach this campus, Raman Research Institute, and I came from Delhi and I don't know where it is, so somebody will give me some address and we'll talk about some landmarks, signposts. Similarly, they act as signposts. So that means in the three billion letter long DNA, you'll have these landmarks here or there, and they are very variable from one person to another. So use them as you use as a researcher, these landmarks, to reach some unknown place, like I would have reached this particular institute, not knowing where it's located. Anyway, that is besides the point. How do these changes occur? Just for students, you look at this one base change has happened in this DNA, a piece of DNA. It has happened here. It has happened at some other position. And the, these two people either get married or due to other reasons, it comes together. Now you have in the same DNA which was here, there was no change. There was one change at two different positions. Now it's in the same DNA strand. So such DNA strands with no change, different changes, and together generate, these are called haplotypes. So you can again imagine that if you have DNA, which is 3.2 billion letter long DNA, you have such haplotypes across the length of that, which will differ from you to me to another person. And that makes this variation from you to me in the humans, at least at structural level. And these haplotypes can be associated now with the diseases, mapping of genes. So you can use them accordingly. Now, what has happened in the process? In the process, you have become very passionate about investigating a given problem. I only gave an example. I only gave an example that if you have to study now genome as a topic, you raise a lot of questions in this area and you get involved because one question leads to another question and another question. Not only has it broken the monotony, which I said is the first take home message, being in science and research, it also creates that passion in you to investigate that problem further. And I have put some questions over here. I've said you can ask a question, curiosity question, how did it diverge, how did it evolve? It links with that biodiversity question to begin with. You can ask a question that it's a self-assembly molecule. It gets packed within the nucleus. The size of the nucleus is going to be 5 to 10 micron. Now, if you have studied your physics, chemistry, biology well in your earlier days, and you, you are exposed to mathematics, and you, these days you are exposed to computer language also, and you ask a question, how is it that it gets accommodated? Such a huge molecule, centimeter long molecule, is getting accommodated in 5 to 10 micron size. You can pose a question which a computer scientist cannot pose. You ask a question, can I make a now a language which can be fast computing and I can do it on the desktop? You can say that this much is accommodated, information is accommodated, which gets processed so fast within the nucleus, so can I write an algorithm to understand how this is accommodated here, the chromatin, chromatin be read, and the principle should be understood well, so that when you confront such problems in future as a graduate, undergraduate, postgraduate, then you ask questions accordingly and sort them out or solve them, and you become passionate about them. And similarly, other questions, I'm not highlighting them here, so you have other questions. We ask this question in case of leprosy a disease. Uh, quickly, I will tell that why did we choose leprosy as a model? Because M. leprae as a bug which infects and leprosy is caused does not change, does not mutate very quickly. But host responds differently. We respond differently. There are two sets of leprosy cases and borderline cases which are different. Why are they different? If there is one mycobacterium leprae, if there is a one a mycobacterium tuberculosis, then everyone, every human being should have got the same kind of disease. So we couldn't have picked up tuberculosis because tuberculosis and tuberculosis that changes. But leprae does not change. So it gives you a handle in human situations where you cannot have animal model, you cannot do culture of this. You have to study human beings. So you pick up this model, you say, 
Well, M. leprae does not change much, but humans will respond differently. Let me understand how humans respond. And we looked into all the aspects of this in a very comprehensive manner. This is another approach that you look at the questions in a very comprehensive manner. We ask the question that if we compare the genomes, where are similarities and dissimilarities? We look for these variations across the genome, try to understand, try to understand them functionally. We asked an interesting question here. We asked a question that if M. leprae was there in evolution before human being, that means when we were there in the universe, M. leprae existed already. Once Homo sapiens sapiens came, or even before Homo sapiens, other hominins were there, whether Erectus, Habilis, Donovan, all kinds of other species. So once sapiens came, somehow mycobacterium went inside that, started living in macrophages, those cells over there. The question arises, in this period of 100,000 years, what happened between these two partners? Because M. leprae existed, did not change much, did not mutate much, but what happened to the human beings that one human being started responding differently another human being gave a disease differently. So you ask such innovative question, and you try to answer them, and you find answers in the genomic evolution of the humans and try to answer those questions. And the question is in evolution, because this is one of the areas in biology which can, which can tease anybody's brain, and you can ask hundreds of questions over here to answer and then extend them to the human health and the disease epidemiology in the population, different ethnic groups, and come out with answers where diseases can be cured, because it gives you a wider perspective. Second lesson, take home messages. Being in science and research throws challenges. You saw, you saw in the previous example I, I gave you that what kind of challenges are there and what kind of questions can be asked and then, if they are answered, it's a challenge to address those questions. Let me pick another example. Now, this is again a challenge. Cancer is a challenge. And I pick up breast cancer over here. The challenge is that during development, there will be a small bud, it will grow, there will be divisional activity of tubules inside, and then there will be pubertal period, there will be pregnancy when they're married, there will be lactation, a lot of divisional activity. So what you have, this female is carrying the burden from the parents of the bad gene. We know in breast cancer, familial cases, you have BRCA1, BRCA2 mutated, but it represents only 10% of the cases. That means 10% of the breast cancer will be, breast cancer will be only having BRCA1, BRCA2. How about 90%? So you start asking a question. Well, how about 90% of such breast cancer cases? What is going wrong with them? Is there something which is happening from the parents and exists at this stage and only sustains all through? Or is it that during divisional activities, during puberty and lactational period, there is some error happening and then damage is caused? So is it that this is called germline and this is called somatic? So is it germline or is it somatic? So you ask such questions and you address such questions. You do all kinds of research. You look at mapping of new genes. You look at expressions of these genes. You look at DNA damage response if it fails. If the cell does not die, apoptosis does not happen, it will survive and become cancerous. Or if immune surveillance is weak, so cells will still survive, these cancer cells. And so we look at epigenetic, microRNA, whole mitochondria. So you do all whatever is fashionable in biology, you do all and try to answer this question. This may not be innovative approach to my understanding, but this was exploratory in my times of 40 years back, 20 years back, 30 years back. I, we had to ask this question because you do not know why 90% are getting cancer. 10% were answered, but 90% were not answered. So it had to be exploratory. We became wiser through that process of, uh, that's an experience, and we answered some questions. So what you do is, for youngsters over here, whenever you have to grope in dark, and in genet as a geneticist, you have to adopt an approach which is called hypothesis-independent approach. 
you don't have any hypothesis and you're groping in dark. These days, it's whole genome is at your level. Whole transcriptome can be studied, whole metabolome can be studied, all the omics can be studied at very high throughput levels. So you hear about them. So you can do hypothesis independent and then come to answer the question that in this jungle, where is it lying, either in the genome or in transcriptome? Another is hypothesis dependent approach, that you have a hypothesis if DNA damage response is not good, if apoptosis, which is cell death mechanism, is not good. These bad cells will not die. If they will not die, they will survive with the baggage of genomic instability. And once they survive with baggage of genomic instability, they'll become cancerous in nature. If immune system of ours is not good enough to fight it out, to kill these cells, the T cells are not recruited over there, or they are get recruited, but they fail to target this tumor, so the tumor grows. That is hypothesis dependent. So you adopt. So we previous slide I showed you, we took both hypothesis independent approach, hypothesis dependent approach, since you want to answer a fundamental question. And we came out with some answers. Let me not go into the details of how we looked into all kinds of backgrounds. I'll, I'll tell you what is innovative about it, uh, that part of story. So what is innovative about it is that we, we we said there are so many things happening over there. Genes get mutated. If I pick up one cancer, one gene is mutated. It happens to be a kinase. There is another. It happens to be a cell cycle related gene. Then I do another cancer. It's another ABCD gene. How many genes will you target for drug or design your drug? You cannot target so many genes for drug in each individual. So there has to be some thinking. So the thinking we did, which we were not accepted for, 30 years back, but then became rage now, in, that's for cancer metabolism. So we thought, is there anything that in the tumor, events are happening at gene level, events are happening at mitochondrial level, events are happening at communication between these two, can the, all these events converge on some metabolic event which can be a single event? Now suppose if genes are mutated, if anything is happening at other levels of that, transcription, translation, anything, or if mitochondria is behaving abnormally and all that is happening, crosstalk is happening bad in a bad manner, but can there be in this cell, which is cancer cell, the event converging to a single point in metabolism? So we investigated, fortunately, I was working on a particular syndrome, which we reported for the first time in India, there's Bloom syndrome, and then it gets cancer in young age, and when we saw that map, that particular gene over there, and we found this pyruvate kinase in the glycolytic pathway, this is, glycolysis is so important for all of us, and in the glycolytic pathway at last step, this particular enzyme is non-functional, does not function. It's called pyruvate kinase, one of the isozymic forms. There are two genes for this. One of the genes makes two products, another gene makes another two products by two different mechanisms. And this particular gene, which makes these two products by alternative splicing. So we looked into that, PKM2 and PKM1. So what happened? This is a, this is a iso, uh, this is a homotetramer enzyme. And this homotetramer enzyme is an active enzyme. And it, in cancer, it becomes a dimer. So that was the catch. To cut the whole story short, so we found out by our experiments that even if in cancer you will have high expression, but this high expression of pyruvate kinase M2 is not playing a role because it's inactive. It's a dimer. It's more of it is dimer. So it's inactive. And this inactive keeps it in a flux, which is anabolic flux. Anabolic flux means it needs more of nucleotides, lipids, all that for the cancer cell to grow. So it provides that milieu in the cell to grow. Now, since we have a single target, we could have you know, designed a drug, which is what we did in due course of time, but we had to have the proof for this. The proof for this is in sciences, you may have anything to offer, but, and you may be very passionate about it also, but unless you come out with a final answer, a logical answer, nobody is going to take you seriously. So the answer was, this is called soft agar colony assay, this is nude mouse tumor assay, and we showed that these, what we call this dimerization of this enzyme is leading to, and other researchers picked upon the stories and they said that it goes inside the nucleus, it acts as a co-activator, this is for others. 
um, and then exercise transcription factor, does non-glycolytic functions. So now we have a lot of story about this particular enzyme. So what is the carry home message? Carry home message is that there is an excitement of the innovations and discoveries once you are in uh, science and research. There has to be fire in the belly. If there is no fire in the belly, you will not be pursuing this research to the logical end and obviously we ask further questions that okay if this is happening it's pro proliferation cancer but in cancer inside you will not get oxygen you will not get because there is no circulation over there there's no blood vessels over there and uh, there is hypoglycemic situation glucose does not reach there food does not reach there so what will happen in that case so we worked out on pathways and answer those questions that there is pro-proliferation mechanism and there is pro-survival mechanism and there's a very good shift happening in the tumor. And we had the complete story, a perspective of that to understand it very well. And then we asked a question, okay, it seems diabetic people are prone to cancer and it also seems that insulin will be dysregulated, so what will happen? So we worked out that pathway, turns out through this pathway, this particular enzyme, pyruvate kinase M2 enzyme, it goes high, but through this pathway, it's inactive. Its activity is reduced, and that's what I told you, that it dimerizes, its activity goes down, it's pro-proliferation, it helps tumor to grow. So you ask such questions, you go further and you say, well, lifestyle habits and dietary habits are so bad, and mitochondrial outputs are affected, so in such a situation, does this particular enzyme figure out there? So you're sub giving a supportive evidence from all angles to say, well, that is happening. If anything you talk about would, would lead to this particular phenomenon. And the carry home message becomes that yes, it's a very good molecule for targeting. So I won't go into the details of that and say, well, it, is, it seems to be working towards that. So you have to develop strong nerves, keep them intact, so not only is the message that it's non-monotonous, not only that it leads to an excitement once you discover something, but you also have to keep your nerves, so you have to develop strong nerves to carry out, to be in science and uh, uh, to be in research. But what is the outcome? Quickly, in one minute, I'll tell you what is the outcome. Outcome is that you as a good scientist, if you are, I'm not, I don't know, I'm not saying that I'm a good scientist, but I say, well, if you become a good scientist, then you become very balanced and you don't waver, you, don't, you have a consistent attitude. I think this is wonderful. If you're becoming a good human being and when you follow science and you do research and you're passionate about it and you're very objective about it, then you become a good human being too. You're very analytical and obviously when you're analytical, you'll be sought for because you're an effective human being. You're very observant and uh, when you're observant, you're a very reliable human being. And you're creative. So these are, the, these are the outcomes of being in science and pursuing research as your career that you can be all this, but you have to keep your nerves. And then I do agree, although I didn't have a mentor, but there has to be a good mentor who will also guide you, hold your hand, take you further. And I think in India, for all of you youngsters, I have a firm belief that mentoring is required. And the mentoring is required not only at your level, but even as young faculty who, who even come from abroad and be here, mentoring is required. So I think good mentoring is required. I just deliberately, I do, I'm not a PR person, I've never done that. But I thought probably for you people, young generation, YouTubes could be one of the ways of I got half an hour opportunity over here. You could listen to these and then know what opinions one has and how things should shape up. So the bottom line is that being in uh, science and research is definitely what all I have, the ingredients I have talked about, and that's very important to be there. And you should not be, you should be rest assured that as far as the science part is concerned, there have been these people who have contributed to it uh, solely. Thank you so much for patient listening. Why you should be in science and research? Yeah, sure.
Oh, wonderful. That's true. That's true. Wonderful. Thank you. So, um, thank you. Um, uh, the next speaker is uh, Professor Arvind, who is a theoretical physicist uh, with research interests focused on quantum information theory, quantum optics, and uh, foundations of quantum mechanics. Um, he was one of the first scientists in India to start research in the area of quantum computing and quantum information theory. Uh, he's uh, guided uh, several PhD students and uh, uh, has, has uh, many papers uh, in this area to his credit. Uh, uh, Professor Arvind is a, uh, is a faculty member at ISA Mohali, um, and he's been there from uh, its, its founding. Uh, he did his BSc uh, from Guru Nanak Dev University in Amritsar, a master's degree in physics from IIT Kanpur, and uh, obtained his PhD at the Indian Institute of Science. Uh, and uh, for his research contributions, he was awarded the INSA Young Scientist Medal in 2000. Um, <coughs> so uh, before coming to uh, Aisa Mohali, he was a fa faculty member at the Guru Nanak Dev University and at IIT Madras. Uh, so um, uh, at Aisa Mohali, he's uh, sort of uh, played uh, several uh, roles uh, institutionally as, as a dean of research, dean of students, uh, etc. And um, in addition to his research and teaching activities, uh, so he um, has a strong interest in science outreach and in uh, developing pedagogical experiments for physics uh, teaching uh, laboratories. And uh, so, um, so he's going to talk to us about the the ISA uh, experiment in science education, uh, which is something that he has witnessed. Uh, um, throughout the entire period of that experiment being carried out. So I, I welcome Professor Arvind. Make it full screen view. All right, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am very happy to be here and for this opportunity to speak to all of you this afternoon. Uh, it has been uh, very interesting associating with the dialogue initiative. And it has taught me many things. It has been even more interesting to be associated with the ISER initiative. And the person responsible for that is the founder director of ISER Mohali, who is sitting right in the second row of this audience. I'm glad that he came. He got me involved with ISER as about 10. The younger you are, more things you can think about. So anything which comes to your mind, please feel free to share with me. All right, so mm, new initiatives in education arena uh, came in the past decade, little more than a decade, with the creation of five new ISERs, new institutions called ISERs, Indian Institutes of Science Education and Research. Five of them came up in years 2006, 7, and 8. 16 new IITs were added in year 2000 onwards. There were five uh, which, were, which started in 1950s, few more were added in 1990s, and 30 new central universities have been uh, started in India and so on and so forth. So these are the new initiatives which, uh, which came up. And ISERs are part of that particular initiative that we are uh, this particular time when it happened. Uh, there are three ISERs which came in phase one. One is Kolkata, one in Pune, one in Mohali. And then two more were added at Bhopal and Tevantpuram. And then two more, one at Bahrampur and then one at Tirupati. So, Total seven ISERs exist today, uh, and they're all kind of doing similar, engaged in similar things. 
So the ISER programs, uh, there is a five-year postgraduate degree, which we call MS, which we now call BSMS dual degree. It's our flagship program. In this program, we take students after 12th, and then they do a master's, master's of science in five years. Uh, we have an integrated PhD program where we take students after BSc, and then they do MS and PhD together. Then, of course, we have a PhD program uh, in basic sciences, uh, environmental sciences, mathematics, humanities and social sciences, and so on. So uh, roughly speaking, there are three entry points after 12th, after BSc, and after MSc. And there are two exit points. One is a master's exit point, and one is a PhD exit point. So that's the kind of programs we have at ISERS. Uh, there is a vision, and uh, the, the vis the, 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 uh, so vision is that we envision a new generation of scientists dedicated to the pursuit of knowledge in frontier areas of basic sciences and emerge as a global center for learning, academic excellence, and innovative research. As was mentioned in the previous talk that uh, uh, there is a lot of scope to do science, maybe some of the later things I will talk about, we will analyze it a little more critically also. And there is a mission to create uh, as a center for academic uh, excellence, uh, imparting quality science education, and inculcation the spirit of research through innovative teaching and research methodologies. So this is the uh, vision and mission of these institutions that we are talking about. Uh, the original idea of setting up of, uh, of such institutions, uh, I could trace it back to a Planning Commission document of 1987. This document is also quoted uh, in the report uh, which Academy produced. Uh, I'm glad Professor Mukunda is sitting here. He was the author of that report. In 1987, it uh, very nicely, the Planning Commission document actually uh, says that one should create institutions uh, which have five-year MSc program where highly talented students uh, are trained. It should be a flexible, broad-based curriculum. I was very happy to see this in this report. But then the Planning Commission document goes further that if we do this as Tier 1, then at Tier 2, so this should, this should aim at 0.5% uh, to 1% of the students in the country because you can, if you create new institutions, you will be catering to a very small number. Tier 2, you aim at 16% of students to raise the general level of undergraduate science education at, large, uh, at a large number of colleges. And in Tier 3, you target the whole country where you use different means of uh, networking these institutions. So these Tier 1 institutions, which are new institutions created, they would kind of network with this large set of institutions and colleges and universities, and together they would try to impact the largest arena of science education. So that was the vision of the Planning Commission of 1987. So therefore, it is very, very important to analyze the uh, ISER experiments in the back backdrop of this particular document. Uh, before we get into, so before we get into a more detailed analysis of uh, these aspects, I want to kind of uh, um, talk about few of the features of uh, ISERs. So ISERs, after 12th, when people join, there is a uh, course, uh, co course semesters, common curriculum is followed for all students. And then at some stage, they, they major into one of the subjects. Some ISDARs are more flexible on this. Some ISDARs are a little less flexible on this. The course structure is a very broad-based course structure. Uh, there is a workshop training, hands-on electronics, computer courses. Uh, there, are, there is a concept of elective courses even in first and second years, courses like quantum mechanics for scientists, astronomy, chemical biology, theory of computation. These are elective courses offered in first two years to expose students to various kinds of uh, uh, things that they are interested in. We teach history and philosophy of science as mandatory courses. There is a certain amount of literature and humanities courses which are mandated to be taught during the five years. So it's a very broad-based uh, curriculum. Uh, there is a focus on laboratory courses. And the fifth year is spent primarily doing research. So uh, undergraduate students in their last year do a one-year research project in these institutions. So these are some of the highlights of the of the curriculum. This morning we were, we were having, a, having a discussion. When this curriculum was being planned, uh, lots of experts from all over the country sat and started thinking about what kind of curriculum is needed in these institutions. And the curriculum process in ISERS is a dynamic process through consultation, senate, and all that. It is continuously modified, and so on and so forth. Uh, what are the graduates from these institutes are doing? Since this is the 10 plus years of ISERS, 
uh, I collected data. So we have produced about 3,000 BSMS graduates and about 500 PhD students from the ISER system so far. I'm talking about those who have graduated. And data shows that 50% of the ISER students roughly are pursuing scientific research in terms of doing PhD after BSMS in India and abroad. Some of them are now doing postdocs who have finished their PhDs after they did BSMS, ITIZER, Mohali, or ISERs. Then they have finished their PhDs wherever they went. And now they are doing postdocs and looking for positions. The first set of uh, PhD students from ISERs have already become faculty members in uh, many institutions, including other ISERs and so on and so forth. Then, uh, since I was supposed to give this talk, I conducted a detailed survey on the first year students, ones who have joined us in 2018. And I was very happy to note that statistically about 50% of them uh, want to become scientists or they have come to the, uh, with the idea of becoming scientists. So this 50% pursuing science after BSMS is correlating very well uh, with the 50% of the new entrants wanting to do science. But I must say that in the earlier years, uh, people did not know what the ISERs were. They started thinking, oh, it is like an IIT, this, that, so on. So early first few years, students did not come with a clear idea what they wanted to do. And we also used to be worried at times that what they really want to do. But now about 50% of them are coming with a clear idea of uh, doing science. Uh, public image of science has definitely changed after these institutions were created. Uh, I have been involved with science outreach for about 25 years. And uh, whenever one talked about science or scientists and all that, uh, it was always thought of very few people. So horizons of scientific research in the minds of general public and students expanding due to ISERs, people know about ISERs now. People kind of are aware of the fact that careers are available in science and so on. Uh, now students are thinking about science as a career. Several of our students who come through the JE stream get admission in IITs, but they don't go to IITs because they don't want to become engineers. Instead, they want to become uh, scientists. So this trend also we have seen that uh, students do that. This about uh, 10 to 15 percent of our students are of this variety. Uh, KVPY program of Department of Science and Technology, which started uh, in Bangalore, uh, and the INSPIRE programs have uh, contributed greatly to this new, uh, this changed uh, kind of uh, image of uh, science. And INSPIRE camps to which I go very often and I find out, to see, uh, find out what people want to do, this idea that one can pursue science is something which is not uh, completely alien in the minds of uh, next generation. Uh, so um, the new horizons which I've opened up of our several variety, I thought I will highlight three. The research possibilities in ISERs of, of a different variety because in the beginning when institutions were set up, a good amount of infrastructure and funding was available for scientists to set up uh, new kind of research, research and programs. Uh, undergraduate research is a very strong component. As I told you that uh, one whole year of the program is research and students also do research during their summers and so on and so forth. And interdisciplinary research, this is because our curriculum itself is very interdisciplinary. In the first two years, everyone learns everything. And, uh, and let, let me give you an example. Last year, for example, see I'm a theoretical physicist. Uh, Dr. Prasad is an evolutionary biologist. And we guided a student who was a mathematics major and worked on reverse possibility of reversibility in evolution. So such things are possible in ISERs, which may not be possible in many other uh, institutions which have BSc programs and so on and so forth. So these are, but there are many other things, but I thought uh, these three I was important to my mind that this is what uh, is, is happening and these possibilities are there. Uh, so, uh, so in some sense, we are now uh, have established, in, we are established institutions and these are the kind of activities which uh, we are doing and uh, so on. But the point is that there are a number of challenges. So in 2018, if I'm talking about the ISER experiment, these challenges are extremely important. The first challenge is that these students we are producing, uh, these 3,000 students we have produced, about half of them are currently doing PhD. Uh, about half of them are interested in maybe coming to India and doing science. Let's assume out of these 500 PhD students, half will settle abroad, half will settle in India. Where are the jobs? That is the most important question. Uh, 
the government funded colleges in Punjab last hired faculty members in 1996. That is exactly 22 years ago. And I thought maybe it's Punjab, most states. Most universities in India, the departments have two, three, four faculty members running programs. No hirings are happening. So if one, if, if one hand of the uh, system or MHRD is creating these institutions which are going to produce this very high quality uh, scientific uh, human power, where are they going to get absorbed? That is a question which we need to ask. I remember in the film that we made uh, on Aizar Mohali, Prasatyamurti had said that this is going to be a percolation effect. Our graduates are going to go to universities, colleges, and the next set and the next set. But we seem to be stuck at the first set itself that the job market in India, the jobs, academic jobs in India are not opening up. Jobs are there, but hirings are not happening. So one needs to address this. Colleges, universities are not hiring. Arena of higher education and scientific research is not expanding. Now, just now you must be saying that I am saying something contradictory. See, it is expanding in terms of in creation of these institutions. But as I will show you, these institutions are a very small, small ecosystem. The bigger ecosystem and the arena of education and research is not expanding. Entrepreneurship is just an empty word if you look at statistics in India. How many, how many people are becoming entrepreneurs? It's a word which is being used, but it is not a practical solution for the graduates that we are producing. The, uh, the next challenge is, where are we getting our students? Who are the people coming to ISER? So I thought I should not uh, share my prejudice. I did a full data analysis of the 2018 batch. So 150 students responded. 92 come from cities, 32 come from towns, 26 come from villages. But 70% of Indians live in villages. So this is, uh, this is less than 20%. Of 92 city students, only four had non-English medium in their 10th. Of 32 town students, only five had non-English medium in their 10th. And of 26 village students, only six had non-English medium in the 10th. But most of our students in this country do their 10th in vernacular. Where are they? They are not in ISERS. So you see the statistics here. Out of 150, 100 come from CBSC. Only 50 come from all other state boards put together. Correlation between family income and possibility of ISERS. I thought it will go like this, you know, up and down. No, it goes up and up. More is your family income, more is the, more is the chances that you are in ISER. So the highest number of people were from the highest income bracket. So that graph I'm not showing, 20, only 22 were in one to three lakh bracket, only 11 students were in the one, was, uh, less than one lakh bracket, and uh, lots of them, most of them were in the highest possible bracket that I had put uh, for income. So this challenge we have to address, that if we want to do talent search and nurture it, then most of that talent we are leaving out. Because that talent is there in villages, in... Actually, see, this is data about people who do 12th. But there are lots of people who don't even do 12th in science. So even if you look at all those who do 12th in all the plethora of state boards, is there talent there or is there no talent there? There is equal amount of talent there. And that data I'm not showing, but I also collect data last week on 100 students which had come to Punjab University under the IAPT, Indian Association of Physics Teachers program, and they had come from colleges. They asked me to speak, I spoke to them. And I interacted with them for about two hours, and I would say, in terms of talent, they are no less than either students. And there are many such groups of hundreds and hundreds and thousands of students uh, which have equal amount of talent. We need to see how we tap. If these institutions are the best ones and they are kind of uh, uh, being funded heavily and so on, they must take measures to get the best talent out of the country. And this statistic shows that it is at the moment not happening. We have to take up this challenge. Uh, third challenge we need to take up is that uh, we have a program, we have a curriculum, but are we investing in developing new paradigms in science education? Are we going to give new experiments to BSc students, our own and others? Are we going to kind of uh, uh, develop, uh, find out how exactly we should go, go forward with the undergraduate and postgraduate education, do research, all that on such aspects? Institutionally, of course, individuals in most institutions are there who do it, 
but institutionally we need to work on this. Then we must act as if we want to implement the uh, tier two of the planning commission vision, then we must act as resource centers for pedagogy in the regions in which we are based. Are we doing it institutionally? We are doing it, but we should institutionalize that. And uh, aspects, these aspects need to be encouraged and institutionalized and rewarded within the system. So this is the third challenge. The fourth challenge, well, I put it here uh, in a different way. See, they, I just looked at uh, four universities which affiliate colleges near Aizar Mohali, and I didn't know that there are 35 to 50,000 students doing BSc around us. Uh, what are we? So we, we train 200 students. And that itself, we are saying 200 into seven isers, whatever, 1,400 every year. And into three years, if you multiply, that's a number. But 35 to 50,000 students are in BSc programs. Many of them would be highly talented. Should we not develop programs for them because we are we, to, to implement tier two uh, of the 1987 document? So academically, we must remain elite. But culturally, we should become humble and not become elitist, and we should, uh, we should cultivate inclusive culture in these institutions and not exclusive culture. One of my colleagues once told me that if we go too many times to colleges, they will start thinking that we are also teachers like them. So that culture we must curb and become culturally humble and inclusive. That's the fourth challenge we have to take up. Uh, the fifth challenge, of course, is connections with society, uh, which also we must address. Dialogue is doing it, and we should collaborate with that. Uh, connection between science and other knowledge systems, which is happening because we have uh, humanities and social sciences and all that, ISERs, we must institutionalize and develop them. Connection with the industry. This is a very big black box. Everyone talks about it. But where is the connection between Indian Academy and industry at the scale that one is envisaging? Uh, one must invent this connection instead of talking about it at small level, wherever we can, uh, uh, and then see how it moves. And we should also connect with people science movements which came about in this country from uh, 1980s and is a full arena in its own self. And as institutions, we, we must see whether we would like to connect with these institutions and how we forge uh, partnership with all these, all these uh, entities. So um, what is the future outlook? So how to, of course, is to how to maintain, we have a positive impact. We have established certain uh, uh, paradigm and we must maintain positive impact. We must overcome the challenges that I talked about to generate exponential impact. In another talk, I had talked about it in JNU, that our impact is linear. But expectation from us is exponential impact. Why? Because we are working with 0.5 to 1% of the talent. And that should not, that should produce an exponential effect in society. And how we do it, I don't know, but we must uh, take up this challenge and see, if not exponential, maybe we will produce quadratic, some function better than linear impact we must aim for. Uh, this can happen only if we brainstorm and do a course correction if needed. Uh, we require sustained support at least for 20 more years because, see, education is an arena in which nothing happens in five years, 10 years. So if the state has created these institutions, it should do uh, hand-holding uh, at least for uh, 20 years so that uh, a tangible outcome comes out of this whole process of creating these institutions. Finally, I would say that science and science education in India can undergo a makeover, which we all are looking for, catalyzed by new institutions, but not only through them. And this last part I would like to underline, unless we build partnerships with the larger ambience of education and society in this country, we will not be able to give a makeover to Indian science. We can only act as a catalyst. So, yeah, I would like to actually stop here. This is a nice picture from Aizar Mohali of flowers few years ago, which uh, tells you that we are <laughs> flowering. But, yeah, so now the uh, house is open for discussion. Yeah, see, I must say that the Planning Commission has envisaged that, and that they envisaged for Tier 3. 
so let us not shy away let's not kind of hide behind and not do tier 2 uh, t- that will come at tier 3 because uh, the 16% uh, connecting with 16% students in the region is the challenge we should take it up doing it physically through material through various things then we can use maybe i mean that's that's the planning commission vision and i kind of agree with that but there's an alternative model people are talking about where they say that you go from 1 to 3 and jump 2 but i don't agree with that that's basically saying that let's not take responsibility let's put lot of resources on the web and let people look at it yeah That's a very interesting question. I didn't quote this in that spirit. You see, what I'm saying is that a set of people who thought about reinventing science education and undergraduate science education in India, after a lot of thought, came up with this. You take it or you reject it. I don't think uh, I'm saying that this is an official document that is a guiding principle. And I found this a very nice guiding principle. After all, a set of... Uh, I mean, this must be a set of academicians or scientists whom Planning Commission asked to sit with them and uh, give this plan. And they did it in 1987. And see how useful it is today. These institutions were created only in 2006-07. Yeah, you, maybe we should carry forward. That's what I'm saying. We must brainstorm now. Now that we have these institutions, we must maybe create a center which would actually come up with way how, how we can do this. May not be exactly this, but this is a guiding document and it's important because it comes from 1987 thinking these institutions did not exist at that time yeah a separate unit that only does the tier 2 kind of outreach and that is actually institutionalized as one of the six or seven departments in the institute. And its entire job is doing physical outreach by organizing things in colleges and schools and bringing college and school students to the center for one or two days at a time for programs and so on. So maybe that is one aspect of the institutionalization that there should be sort of a, a dedicated structure like the bio department, like the physics department in an ISER whose job is outreach. Yeah, so that's an interesting uh, point you're making. And you are doing it because it's part of various activities. But for us, it is in some sense part of our mandate. And therefore, we have to do it at a bigger scale. But, and, and we can learn from all kinds. For example, Professor Saraf developed his experiments in 1960s under UGC. And those experiments, still you go to universities, those experiments are being used, what he developed. So. Those are also very interesting examples that we must maybe begin. Uh, and, and there's another very uh, aspect that you go to um, colleges with BSc. The experiments on which they do their experiments are sometimes 50-year-old, 40-year-old, 60-year-old. Same experiments continue. Nobody changes the syllabus and nobody produces the new instruments. Maybe ISIS can take the lead. And that will partly, that will partly also address the other question. Uh, the scientific instrument industry will get a boost. They will, they will, they will make new equipment for, for education. And uh, yeah. we can be partners in, in that also. But what you say is very important, that we must have dedicated uh, department center and all that. And outreach should not remain a personal, uh, yeah, you know. Yeah. Like the few individuals yeah. Precisely. So we need to kind of go beyond and institutionalize it. I completely agree with that. So just you, you gave one answer to what I was going to ask. Um, but what, what have been the concrete thoughts of how you were going to interface with Tier 2 in, in terms of either the Planning Commission document or in terms of what the yeah. See, I, ISA yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. faculty so have thought about? That's a very important question. And one answer I can give is that we have been kind of busy starting ourselves and maintaining ourselves. And we have not yet paid institutional attention to Tier 2. But we must. See, the, the honest answer is that we have to start on tier two. But now the question also is how do we start? So we will have to do some brainstorming. We have been doing outreach. We have been interacting with various entities, colleges, universities. But to actually target 
working with those parts of those 30,000, 40,000 students who are doing undergraduate education in colleges around, and many of them are brighter than our students, I tell you. Uh, that is what we need to focus on. So um, I, I want to ask. Uh, I must say that I am putting it like this first time. So I'm go going to go back and put it in my institute also and see the reaction of my colleagues to this also. Yeah. So in terms of, uh, I'm, I'm sorry. One possibility could be to set up a department of science education and then hire faculty. How does it matter how many, one, two, three, four, who the job is to develop pedagogy, develop new experiments, and their career path is evaluated based on that. Yeah, I think that's, I mean, coming from you, I would, uh, it's a very good idea. We must do that, but there is a caveat. It should be done, but then the rest of the institute should not consider them as second-rate citizens. So that we have to be, they should not be second-rate citizens in this system. So that we have to ensure. If we can ensure that, that can be done successfully. Because somehow, I don't know, the culture is that uh, educational activity is considered inferior to research activity in this country. We need to change that mindset somehow. Maybe it can change if this is created. So one way would be to have joint appointments. Yes. To have a joint appointment in the physics department and in the science yeah. department. So you see that brainstorming is already started. And this is what we need. So you, you have joint appointments so that nobody is only in that department. So there is no second rate citizen. Very, that's a great idea. Yeah. So we should do that. Now this, this will involve rethinking, yeah. evaluation, processes. Yeah, so my, which, I must say, also I, I must take a step back and say, my point was to highlight the challenges, not really to give the solutions. I mean, that will come, these institutions will come up with the solutions. and the faculty themselves directly interact with that on a rotation basis. So that's also a part of the career. I yeah. think it's a very good system to evaluate. Yeah, that's what Amitabh is suggesting, have a dual uh, role. OK, I thought one student wanted to ask something, but she says now. But are there others? Who... Uh, there is one student there. Eh? Take the mic. Hi, uh, my question is related to jobs, I mean, which is kind of obvious for the student uh, to be concerned about. Uh, I don't understand what's the difference of uh, a difference between jobs in science and engineering. Like, there's a lack of jobs in engineering also. Like, I mean, the number of people doing engineering and the people who get jobs in engineering, again, I mean, a lot of people who do engineering do a lot, lot of like service sector jobs and other kind of BPO jobs and many other things. So, uh, so how is it different in like science? Like when you don't have jobs in science, and like what is the disparity exactly? Of yeah, I I don't have a full statistics on it, but one thing I know is that you can hire a B Tech in five thousand rupees per month, who's a pass B Tech from a okay kind of college. So there are enough jobless B Techs that if I want to hire in my project, I can hire for five thousand rupees per month. That is possible. Maybe a BSc also I can hire in 5,000 rupees. <laughs> well, what I was talking about was slightly different. What I was talking about was that if you are going to invest and create a very high quality scientific human power. So I'm not talking about uh, everyone who's doing a BSc or a BTEC or engineering or whatever. What I'm talking about is that Iser graduates, which are 0.5%, came through all those competitions. Those of then half of them decided to do research after BSMS. Half of that want to become scientists in India. Where are the jobs for them? Yeah, but what are the numbers? How, how many people can, if you really want to expand the arena of research and science, you need to expand it in a rather big way. Otherwise, most of these people will be, like one of my colleagues was saying that if an uh, Iser PhD will find a bank job, will pass your checks, but will curse Iser for all his or life. <laughs> so, so we need to expand that arena. If we, yeah. Precisely. Yeah. 
Yeah, so precisely, Professor Tamurti, I was alluding to exactly that, that there are vacancies, we need to have the willingness to fill them. But unfortunately, in state universities and colleges, those vacancies are not being filled. So that policy change has to come. So that's what I said, that same MHRD which is creating these institutions should also open up the hiring of faculty in universities and colleges, which has been stopped in many places for decades. As I told you, in Punjab, the data is that after 1996, no faculty was hired in colleges on a permanent basis. People are hired only on a year's contract. So this situation has to change. Mm -hmm. I went to Kavimpu University, and their Kannada department has two permanent faculty members. Okay. My question is also related to jobs. Uh, in one of your slides, you mentioned that there is hardly any connection between the academic institution and the industry. Uh, that, uh, it's quite uh, difficult for me to understand because the employees are the human resource for industry. Why aren't the industries interested in having, uh, I mean, to invest in education? Like Wipro works in a big way in education, but it's quite strange that these two are disconnected units when they're supposed to be going hand in hand. Yeah, so we need to create that, uh, that ambience where uh, industry comes forward and invests not just, see, industry, when will industry invest? Under two, two circumstances. One is if they get very serious tax benefits, and other is when the manpower trained through those programs is going to feed back into the industry. So these are the two conditions under which industry will invest. So we should create those conditions. That the moment they don't exist. Most of the industry picks up their technology from international market. Most of the science and technologies we produce, we publish in the international journals. The direct connection between technology developed here with the industry here is very minimal. Okay, so let's thank uh, Professor Arvind for a very thought-provoking talk. Uh, I'm sure there are more questions. Uh, we will take a coffee break now for 15 minutes, uh, and we'll come back for the last talk.
Tony. So, um, okay, so uh, we resume the uh, talks. Um, the next speaker is uh, Professor Rajeshwari Raina from uh, uh, the School of Humanities and Social Sciences at Shivnada University. Um, uh, so Rajeshwari Raina um, is in the uh, <coughs> Department of International Relations and Governance Studies and is the Associate Director of the University Center for Public Affairs and Critical Theory. Uh, she has a background in the agricultural sciences and social sciences. She has a PhD uh, from the Center for Development Studies in Trivandrum. Uh, her research uh, explores the complex relationships between development policy and knowledge, both formal scientific and various informal knowledge systems. Uh, her research questions have been mainly in the social studies of science, innovation systems, policies, uh, and institutional landscapes. Um, sorry, um, I said something. Um, um, so, um, so her current research for, uh, uh, focuses uh, on, on uh, the knowledge politics of and institutional reform for poverty relevant science, technology and innovation, um, ecological and bioeconomic well-being, um, sustainable agriculture, environment nutrition interfaces, and state nutrition programs. Um, so she's uh, uh, published uh, uh, widely in international and, and ref, uh, uh, international journals and edited and co-authored books. Um, so the books that she has been a co-editor of are uh, Science, Technology, and Development in India, uh, Encountering uh, Values, and uh, Post-Growth Thinking in India. Uh, she's a, <coughs> a recent recipient of the T.N. Koshu Prize in 2019. Okay, I didn't notice the date. So uh, for bringing uh, knowledge and policy for, uh, uh, for, for sustainability. So I welcome uh, uh, Professor Raina, uh, who will tell us about living soils, science pedagogy, practice, policy questions. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Shastri. It was, um, well, not all of it was meant to be read out. <laughs> not, <laughs> I thought I'd specifically mention that. Um, so good afternoon, everybody. And uh, again, it's a treat, like Arvind said, to see so many young faces. Um, before I start, I just want to want to uh, want to want to want all of you to raise your, raise your hands. Um, how many of you are? Sorry. Oh, is that better? Okay, I think I've got this on. Is this, is this on? It's audible. Okay, um, and also I might just move around. So, um, so uh, have, how many of you have have heard of uh, planetary boundaries? Anybody? Planetary boundaries that uh, that our current economic activities have transcended or violated. No. Okay. One of the one of the most interesting things that's happening in science today is the is well, not really the the demarcation of planetary boundaries, but at least the the evidence that there are certain thresholds in this planet about well, you could say ocean acidification you know, nitrogen and phosphorus cycles which have been disrupted, 
um, biological integrity of the earth, which has been, which have been, well, it's really badly well, gone for a toss, basically. So there, there's been evidence of nine planetary boundaries which, which we should safeguard. In quotes, I'll just say that they, the scientists who work on this also tell us that this is to be done to enable a safe operating space for humanity. Yeah. In other words, we should do it for our own sake, not for the planet. Do we all agree with that, that, that we should do it just for our own sake and not for the planet? Because without, with or without us, the planet will find its resilience, right? So we better note that, that we are small players in this game. The question that I have today, is, and, and I'll refer to agriculture, agricultural science, because that's about the only area that I know well, that I've worked on, worked for, for 25 years of my life, um, like um, both um, Dr. Bamzai and, and um, Arvind said, um, you know, I worked in CSIR, the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research, for 25 years and left. I'm now with Shivnadar University, um, where, well, we are allowed to do, well, a flexible, broad-based curriculum that ISERs also do. Shivnadar University offers a four-year BSc program. The last year is spent doing research. So in any topic that you do, whether it's economics or sociology or English literature or computer science or chemistry or physics or mathematics, you will end up doing one year of research at the end of it. There's also opportunities to do undergraduate research. There's OUR as a program that encourages students early on to do research. What's most attractive for me as a scientist who moved out of CSIR, took voluntary retirement and went to teach, is, is that we are allowed to teach flexible, again, broad-based curricula with interdisciplinary courses. So I'll speak very briefly about some of the courses that I teach too, which um, which again, because the university is research focused, they allow us to teach the frontiers, the, the very new things that are happening in, in the world, in the sciences, especially the biological sciences, agriculture that I look at. Um, and the key question that I, that I ask today is about science pedagogy, not as teaching science, but as asking, do the sciences need to learn? Are the sciences something that have been set and given to us? Or do the sciences evolve, do they learn? And if they do learn, how do they learn? Yeah? What are the ways in which sciences learn? And the case that I'm using is a case of soil. Um, many of us are aware today that India is a country with about, what, 140 million hectares of arable land. 67% of it is considered degraded. Much of it, about 50%, may be irreparably lost. That is really degraded. Problem soils classified into several types of problem soils and so on. Is India the only exception? The rest of the world is also in the same boat. Yeah? So there are many parts of the world where there is a big question of, of well, soil loss as soil degradation, soil erosion, again, irreparable losses of biodiversity, which directly depends on the kinds of soils that are there in different ecosystems. So we're talking about a world that is facing a whole range of threats. And fortunately, the sciences are at the very forefront, again, one, beginning to question the current economic development models that push the push the world to this, to this brink, but also asking questions in ways that, that in some sense do not push enough. Yeah? So are we saying this as the sciences doing a routine job of doing their experiments and giving evidence, or the sciences, do they have a much larger moral responsibility? And in other words, if they do have a much larger moral responsibility, like Arvel said, be culturally humble, engage with our publics, and be actually involved in shaping public affairs, then how do we do it? Yeah? So we have to ask these questions as one, informed citizens, also as very highly privileged. Everybody here, I would count as privileged citizens because we are here in this hallowed hall. Yeah? So um, we, um, I, I'll just, very, how do I move this? Is this what I do? <laughs> okay. okay, great. So this is very briefly to acknowledge some of the sources that I'm kind of referring to. Um, but most importantly, I'd, I'd acknowledge two that are, that are like right at the outset, um, hit us in the face of this, the, the, the courses that I teach. That is knowing and governing ecosystems and economies is one course. And this course called, um, called uh, well, Agriculture in versus the Environment. Now, in these two courses, uh, when Jean Martin is earlier, helped me kind of draft the, the course outline for the first one, Knowing and Governing Ecosystems and Economies. He said, just cover the whole range of environmental social sciences. Just let the students know that there's something called environmental social sciences that are essentially interdisciplinary, which basically means there are different disciplines 
political geography, human geography, cultural ecology, environmental history. Yeah, there's a whole range of these disciplines that are available where the sciences have to play a central role. And therefore, it would feed directly into what, what you're interested in and would also give the students an idea of where and how we pick one or two elements that are economically governable, that is, stuff that we can handle yeah, in, in public policy. Now, this, this question about do the sciences learn and how does it engage with policy and practice sits at the very heart of this course. That is, why do we pick certain, certain instruments, like for instance, payment for ecosystem services or something like that, and not something else? For instance, a decentralized local food shed, which is accountable. In other words, you actually have local accountability and practice and policy located in the same, in the same region, in the same space. Again, the difference between region and space being a region is, is biogeophysical region, and a space is something that is inhabited by human beings and their sociopolitical constructs, right? Which, one of which is science, right? Science is not something that nature has. Science is something that we do as human beings, right? We study how nature works, but it's our construct. Now, that said, <laughs> there are... Um, there are, well, let's say several questions if you want to ask questions about science pedagogy. Do the sciences learn? And how do the sciences engage with practice and policy? There are several questions. But what I want to focus on today is the question of how we know. When we teach this course, when I, when I was teaching this course on, on knowing and governing ecosystems and economies, we discovered that all the environmental social sciences, political ecology, ecological economics, the entire plethora, we talked about, covered about 12 of them, um, they're all getting to this point, especially since the turn of the century, 21st century, they're all getting to, to this point where they're asking, how do we know? Yeah? So Piers Blakey's work, for instance, which, which launched this entire arena of work called political ecology, was about, well, the T ratio in soil erosion. Anybody who's aware of that? So that, that do we take the same, the, the, the same, well, construct that is given to us to measure soil erosion that has been developed for the West, or do we look at soil erosion differently in the Nepal foothills? Yeah? So what do we do? How do we understand this? So what are the different political constructs in soil erosion that we need to understand before we have an accurate measure of soil erosion as scientists? Yeah? So these kinds of questions come up now increasingly as questions that scientists are grappling with and asking, and environmental social sciences are asking questions about how do we understand these interactions not as people-nature interactions, but as people-people interactions, especially if some of these measures are biased right from the beginning against some people, that is, some parts of the population. Equity was, again, part of the discussion in the, in the previous presentation. So if, for instance, you measure, you measure let's say, biological contamination uh, or BOD in, in one of these lakes in Kerala where there are plenty of tourists. Now, Kerala, the government is gaining, I mean, they're all gaining from tourism, but who's facing the pollution? It's the poor who live, eat, drink, bathe in those waters. Yeah? So one septic tank for the entire Vembanad Lake is a crime. Because you should ideally have a series of, of tanks that, that the boats, because boats move, right? So there are public policy questions that are directly related, again, daily life questions that the sciences and public policy have to work out together, but they don't seem to be doing it. So there is a question, there are two sets of sub-questions or sub-framings in the argument about how we know. That is, how do we know? We know because knowledge, policy, and practice are framed in a particular way. For instance, the modern framing, the, knowledge, the modern framing or the modern school framework of knowledge policy relationship says that knowledge is something that can speak, give evidence to policymakers, and policymakers implement those decisions, and everything is fine. Yeah? The precautionary principle framing says, well, there is particular kinds of knowledge, but it also says this is all we know as of now. So as a policymaker, you take a call on this. There might be more scientific evidence that comes up later. Yeah? I mean, we all thought the Green Revolution was a blessing, but there are lots of problems. I mean, the International Food Policy Research Institute and those actors who celebrated the Green Revolution are now asking, was it a blessing or a bane? Yeah? So we know there have been problems. So science says, okay, this, this is the evidence we have as of now. So precautionary model says, okay, you go ahead and make your decision. We'll come up with more, with more evidence as we have it. Um, the, the third model, again, the, the framing model, the demarcation model, the public engagement model, there are different models in, along which the knowledge policy practice relationship has been framed. So 
when you look at one particular environmental social science in one of these models, you've always, well, you've got to be aware of, well, this is where I am. And therefore, there is an opportunity for both the natural sciences that contribute the metrics for me or an, a better definition of the problem for me, and the social sciences that engage with, well, a whole range of spatial realities, again, human, human created, people, people interactions that exist in these systems. There is an opportunity for me to also change the paradigm, that is, change the knowledge policy practice relationship. Again, every time, every, on every occasion where the knowledge policy practice relationship has changed, the sciences have been party to it. That is, they have worked with it. Yeah? So anybody who criticizes sciences saying, well, you know, anti-science statements and so on, they're wrong because the sciences have always, all our environmental research comes from good sciences, comes from very good, well, Swante Arini is onwards, we know where the good sciences have worked on bringing out the evidence. So in our university, we also have the saying that, that well, the, the university allows you to dream. So I think what the sciences should allow, most importantly, is for all of you to dream, to do just curiosity-driven research. Jobs will come on their own. Sorry. <laughs> so the second point that I want to make about, about how we know is there is another framework that also operates alongside. And that is actually framing the ecosystem, economy, society relationship. That is, there are different frameworks and different disciplines selectively pick one of the two, yeah? For environment, or one of, one of, sorry, one of these three relationships, or let's say one set of these three relationships. So, for instance, the, an eco, that is the ecosystem economy relationship is the subject of environmental economics. The ecosystem, economy, society relationship, where social systems, gender, caste, equity questions, all these are part of it. Again, policymakers and their, and their well, um, administrative logic, these are all part of decision making. That's a domain of ecological economics. Again, measurement of, of material and energy flows. Again, this, these measurement systems have been with us since the 1950s, since Odom's days. Yeah? So MEFA has become a big hit now with, with ecological econ economists. Why wasn't it used in the 1980s? Why is it becoming hot now? Because people are realizing that the planetary boundaries are setting limits. Again, limits to growth is also discussed. Again, within one of these three relationships, that is picking only one of the two, that is the relationship between ecosystem and economy is what has been most studied. Ecosystem, economy, and society where the public, well, public affairs or public policy and practice are both located have been very rarely studied. So we have to ask how these framings exist and also, remember that the latter, that is, the ecosystem, economy, society relationships have agency of their own without us. Society is just one minor part of, of the whole thing. That is, the economy can actually push the ecosystem to a particular level where it can just take over and, and well, claim its pitch. So that said, the, the questions that, that, that I will pose as I go along is in, the, in these framings that is about. There's also a very interesting, interesting set of Strungman Forum articles that have just appeared, um, by, by, uh, headed by Sharad Lele in A3 here, which actually focuses on, on the second part of the framing, that is the framing of eco ecosystem, economy, and society relationships, how the environment is understood in these different framings and what is being discussed in different thematic areas as, as evidence not so much the relationship between knowledge, policy, and practice. So when we ask the how question, there are different ways to do it, right? You can always do what has been done in, in, the, in the normal system. Um, and here, remember, we're using just the case of living soils, that is soil and land, yeah? And land with life. Now, we're talking about systems where, where you have big international assessment. I myself have been part of some of them. Um, now, these are, these are a big international assessment where experts get together, spend three, four years writing reports, and then there is this, this big outreach effort to engage with policymaking, to convince governments and policymakers that these are the things to be done, so you give them a set of policy options, and then they work on this. So with, with soils, especially with land degradation and land question, there's been, that is, it has been part of this, this, this big this inter intergovernmental science policy platform on biodiversity and ecosystem services, IPBES. Now, please note the title. It's called Science Policy Platform. Yeah? Now, the second one that I have, the second example that I want to talk about, which also address living soils, is a very focused, small thing, tiny little thing that happened in India. A few of us, we got together and said, no, we, we've been talking about soils for ages. My first paper on, on the status of Indian soils was written in 2006. 
Yeah? Now, we've been talking about soils um, and, and the status of soil science research and all these for some time. So some leading soil scientists, some leading policy makers, and a lot of civil society actors and farmers, especially farmers who've been doing alternative kinds of farming, got together and said, okay, let's work on soils. Let's put together a, a team that works on soils. So we got together and put this team together. We arranged a conference. We spoke to the government. So this is the second case where, where very consciously we decided to follow a, a model which would bring together both these framings. That is, the framing of knowledge policy and practice together, where if we didn't have a consensus in the room, if we were still arguing, then we would take it to the next level and refine the argument and see what needs to be brought in as gap filling or change in concepts or new theories or whatever need, needed to bridge the gap. But we said we would take this together, knowledge policy and practice together, the engagement, and also make sure that this interest in both practitioners, that is the interest that both the practitioners and policymakers had in the soil sciences, in understanding the ways in which soil degradation was happening, in getting a better problem definition, all these would be addressed. Yeah? So this is the second experiment that we did, uh, which is a small report. Um, so we just go through these two cases as two cases that I want to present as what's happening and, and how this relationship works out. This is what um, the, the global report that's just, just out um, has just addressed. Now, um, one of the problems here is that I mean, so soil degradation is one small part of it, of course, but, um, but given, the, given the scale and again, given the, given the, the, the magnitude of, of knowledge that is available, there is very little action. And is it again very new knowledge? No, we've had this knowledge with us for ages. We've all known right from the 1970s, 1978 was when the Fertilizer Association of India first published its figure saying unit input of chemicals was not giving the same increment in yield as it did just three years ago. Yeah? So we've known this since 1978. We've been doing the same thing over and over again. Why is that so? The answer that, that the practitioners gave us is because the science has refused to learn. Is that true? Maybe yes. The sciences refuse to learn. There are answers coming up in the sciences which seem to be incremental and very narrow. Within the agricultural chemistry lobby, there is increasing answers about doing the same thing with a little refinement. In other words, an incremental change which somehow doesn't seem to answer because it's stuck in this knowledge policy practice framework without asking questions about what is it about our problem statement that's wrong? Are we trying to just increase yield per unit output or are we asking why is it that the yield per, out, yield per unit of, of, of input is declining? What are the problems? What is the diversity of, of reasons that we have? So that said, the IPES has some key messages. Yeah? Now, just take a look at these messages. I don't want any of you to read this in great detail, so I've just highlighted the parts that I thought was important for us to take forward our argument about the sciences and their ability to learn. Now, Land degradation as a pervasive systemic phenomenon can take many forms, of course. Nothing new about it. Everybody has known that for some time. So it's urgent, urgent, urgent and concerted action. Unprecedented consumption is what causes it. Yeah? It's not just production problems, but unprecedented consumption, both in terms of agricultural and industrial expansion and urban expansion. It's unpre unprecedented consumption that's a major driver. Um, urgent step change is needed, but most importantly, even if you implement what we know now, it'll become more and more costly and difficult as we go ahead. Now, what does this tell us? And we are, remember, writing this report as part of an international assessment to convince policymakers to make changes, right? Now, this said, one of the biggest difficulties that the IPES, now not with the land degradation report, but with the next report that's come now, uh, that is going to come now, that's, that they're facing now is that the scientists are now fighting amongst each other. They didn't fight very much on the land degradation thing, mind you, but they're fighting with each other now about the ecosystem services report, that is, the biodiversity report. That is, the estimate of biodiversity loss every day as we sit here now at this very moment, we would have lost about three species. Yeah? Now, every day we're losing species and the rate is going to increase. This, that, is, that is a space of species loss per year is going to be massive. Now, never, never seen before, never, ever, ever heard of before. Now, um, are, we going to, are we going to allow these scientists to squabble? The director of this, of this assessment, Sir Robert Watson, is now crying about how if these scientists are going to squabble amongst each other, none of the policymakers will listen to us. What would your response be? You would say, well, if policymakers are so dumb, 
that they can't understand the scientific debate, then please don't read it out to them, right? Would that, would, would that be what you'd say? Or would you say, oh, oh, let the scientists settle their debates and then we'll come back next year? Now, we don't have the time for that. The urgency for this demands a completely different engagement. We cannot afford to, I mean, Masood and um, Ehsan Masood has written a piece in The Guardian about this, and it's, again, a, much, a very sad kind of story. But, but, the, but, 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 the, but the, greatest, the greatest, well, let's say, tragedy of our times is that the engagement between policy and science and policy, science, and practice seems to be missing, and nobody seems to be lamenting that. And nobody seems to be asking, well, is that, is that well, is the inability of the sciences to learn and engage with the policymakers a crucial problem? Now, we're going ahead with, with what we did in, as part of a small team, a small conference that was organized in, in IIT Delhi. And where, at the conference, we had science scientists, policymakers, and practitioners, many of them who came from different parts of the country. Some of them paid on their own and came just because of their interest, just because they were committed to this, to this conference, saying, well, we need to hear how this dialogue will go, because we've never had all three on, on the same platform. And what kind of engagements will happen there is something that, that drove them there. Finally, the results that came up was, was something that we've all known again for many, many, many years before. Like for, at least for about 20 years, we've known that the three M's have to go together. But it was put together beautifully at the conference, and the three were brought together in a series of engagements well, not, not just as science policy, uh, that are scientists, policy, policy makers, and practitioners, but at different scales. That is, at the farm scale, at the landscape scale, at, at the block level, at the district level, at the state level, at the national level. What are the kind of questions that we need to ask? What are the guidelines that, that we need to have at the policy making level? What are the ways in which some input suppliers, for instance, might change things? You know, these kinds of vested interest kind of questions that we hear. Yeah? There was a whole range of questions that were asked. Again, how does the community engage? How do the scientists learn these things? What kind of experiments need to be done at the landscape level? Why can't we do it at, in, in our agricultural research labs? So what was, what was interesting was that once these three critical factors, that is soil organic matter, soil microbes, and soil moisture came up as the three must-haves for healthy living soils, we said, okay, now we'll go ahead with another, an, uh, our next level of policy engagement. So a group of us as, well, as policy makers, um, well, scientists and, and practitioners had a meeting with the Ministry of Agriculture. And the key messages that we presented were that these are the evidence, this is the kind of evidence that we have, this is the way in which soils, well, behave, and many of these have been validated technologies, of course. Policymakers in the Ministry of Agriculture won't listen to you if you go, go to them without any validation from state agriculture universities or the ICRs, yeah? So we went with that. And um, policy change needed. We said, well, current policies do focus on two parts of soil health, yeah? Basically about the supply of, again, supply, remember you, supply of chemicals or any other input, biofertilizers or whatever it is. So the supply of those supported by policy. And also, there, there are certain other things that the state can do, with, basically with, with ways of working in, in the field. Now, um, what happened following that? The Joint Secretary of Agriculture saw us, and uh, while well, we had a meeting with him, and we said, well, we, what we need is a national program on living soils, with these, with, well, with, with focusing on these three M's as, well, an overarching policy architecture. That is, the goal must be to achieve these. That is, to maintain healthy soils. Yeah? But what do, we, what do we have in this country? We have an absolutely centralized and consolidated scientific research system in the agricultural sciences. Basically, it's one national policy in agriculture. Again, one, one apology of a national policy on agriculture that appeared in the year 2000. We didn't have a national agricultural policy till the year 2000. Our first agricultural policy that, that appeared in the year 2000 seems to be a bit of a shock to many people when we say this. But our first industrial policy, for instance, appeared even before independence. Yeah? Um, it, it was revised, the industrial policy resolution, as the Bombay Plan in 19, 1940s. Um, 1956, the industrial policy resolution. The industrial uh, policy, again, reframed in 1970s. 1983, another amendment. So this is, this is the way this, that sector has been, well, receiving policy attention. Whether the scientists engage with industry or not is a big question, and that is a very, very important question. But that the sciences and policy making have had a different show altogether in the agricultural sector 
which has had no engaged policy making, but just a set of programs that have been put together at an ad hoc basis, which we now call the Green Revolution, is something that's alarming. So there's been a set of, well, the key decision makers up there in Delhi who've decided things for the entire country, right? So people have been, well, scientists who've been put in, put in important positions, have contributed findings to, to program makers, not policy makers, to program designing bureaucrats, and they've put together these convinced, convinced one or two ministers and things have gone ahead. Smooth sailing, unfortunately not. Now what has happened is now things have come to a roost and people are asking questions about this. So what, what we demanded was therefore state level policies, that is state governments, agriculture by the way, constitutionally, according to the Republic of India and its constitution, is a state subject. And it has to be a state subject to, be, to do anything that is reasonable within scale and addressing the local agroecological health of well systems within the state. It's not a question of national policy. It's not, it should not be a national policy. It should be something that happens within the na nation's, nation state as a broad guideline, as some goal that we want to achieve. Like VKR v Rao said, maybe there should be an integrated food, agriculture, and nutrition policy that provides or that minimizes nutritional inequalities. Now, that's a great policy goal. But that's just one policy goal that, that you can have at the national level. What happens as policies and policy instruments must happen at the state level. We are far from this game. So we had a great, great conversation with the Joint Secretary of Agriculture. But what was most interesting was maybe this will fail. Maybe this will go nowhere. But what has been seeded, like the decentralization experiments in Kerala or uh, in, in, in Karnataka, is this idea that scientists, policy makers, and practitioners can sit around the table and talk to each other and agree to disagree, look for more knowledge, look for more inputs, and also enter into a conversation that is meaningful, bring more social sciences, bring more political scientists. What does an ecological democracy mean? Where do we ask questions? Where do we allow the community to speak for itself? So that, that dialogue, enabling the dialogue was a big success for us. Maybe this whole national soils policy will never happen, but the fact that this process was initiated is an important goal for us. So our demand, by the way, was for block level pilots that integrated knowledge from, that integrate different kinds of knowledge from practice and from formal scientific research. But basically, identifying timelines, that is identify appropriate solutions with timelines and also providing options for action that communities can take up depending on what they think is feasible. Again, where does the state come in? The state comes in as an enabling and facilitating actor at the block level. Yeah? Now, again, these have to be decisions that have to be made at the local level with people's participation. Farmers participating in scientific research, that is in participatory plant breeding and integrated nutrient management and have all that have been going on for some time. But scientists participating in farmers' agenda, scientists participating in local ecological problems and understanding water quality or soil quality at the local level has not been happening. And that needs to change. So what is common to both, to the international assessment that we've seen, loaded with experts and producing a really good report on scientific data available on land degradation, on the causes, on, of course, this, this key message is also backed by a background series of background stories about each of these drivers with very good data on each of these. And what is common to both of these? Common to both is policy practice interfaces, that there are practitioners also involved in this, in, these, in the IBEST reports as, as well as in our little group, we had practitioners. They both understand the diverse, diversity of dr drivers of degradation, um, multiple regions and spaces. Again, no region is the same as the other, fine. But each region is also very different, in different depending on the kind of space that this occupies. That is, a spatiality concept in geography has been employed very effectively in each of these dialogues, in both these dialogues and the reports. Individual actors and dynamic systems. Individual actors is what the state focuses on, right? I, as a farmer, will get a subsidy of these many rupees if I face, if I buy inputs. I, as a farmer, will these, get these many rupees of subsidy or these many kind of, well, you know, doles for doing whatever the state wants me to do. So the individual at the end of the pipeline is the way the bureaucracy works. That is, public policy has a way of identifying individual beneficiaries, which goes completely against the grain when it comes to landscape problems. Problems that do not sit within individual property ownership. So that said, singular relations, complex interactions, these were also common to, to both the reports. The supply syndrome was evident in both the, both the reports, and both of them asked questions about why is the state, national governments, bent on supplying things to farmers endlessly? 
Why don't we ask what is it that's needed? What kind of changes are needed in the ways, the way, in, the ways in which the state understands the problem? So is this new? I'll just stop here before we come to what is the, the difference between the two. I just want to say that none of this is new. Unfortunately, what we've seen over the years since the 1940s is a narrowing and, again, a narrowing and an increasing density within the scientific research system, within what we call the modernization project, which has left a whole range of knowledge systems outside the system, outside what we call formal sciences. In other words, an increasing inability of the sciences to learn and change with what has been changing in the world around us under our very nose as our living soils have been, well, deteriorating over time. We've seen this evidence coming from the San County Almanac, Aldo Leopold, which, t which tells us, um, whose, whose work tells us that, that, well, you know, it's the Abrahamic concept of, of land as, as property that, that, uh, that makes us degrade things. But let's ask ourselves, are other religions any different? Doesn't seem so. I mean, all religions treat land and soil as dirt. Mother Earth and all that is great. I mean, it goes like worshipping women. You know, it's, you, you treat them like dirt anyway, and it's, it's, it, it makes no difference. So basically, this is, these are things that we've known. I mean, things that, again, do the sciences enter and challenge them? Yes, there are some cases where the sciences do come up with evidence, but then again, unless the sciences work with practitioners and policy makers, the long-term changes that, that we need, again, like I said, the changes in the knowledge policy practice relationship and the framing of ecosystem, economy, and society relationship, both of them won't change if the sciences don't engage with these questions. Another major source of, of knowledge that we have, I mean, this is something that we've known, Karl Marx s seems to have said a long time ago, this is 1936 is a later edition, of course, um, that all progress in capitalist agriculture happens by robbing two major sources of the origin of all wealth, soil and labor. Yeah? Now again, is it true that only capitalist agriculture robs the soil and labor? We've seen communist systems that have robbed soils and labor too. So there's something that's going wrong with the world that is in the world, in, 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 a, in a world that knows that soils contribute, or as the original source of wealth have contributed immensely to the ways in which economies have grown, wealth of nations have been developed. Even wealth of nations that have plundered wealth from other nations have grown. But the point is that it all, it all came from soil and labor. Now, given that this, these things have been known for some time, and that the social sciences and also people as scientists who've looked at these systems have demanded changes that, that, that have, well, enabled social changes or political changes, we again forget to ask if the sciences are changing, if the sciences are changing and learning with these systems. And my argument over the past, over the past well, let's say, or, or the turn of the century that we've seen now is that the sciences have stopped learning. There's something about the sciences that says, well, look at the biological sciences today. I mean, they're sitting on tons of data. There doesn't seem to be a theory, a coherent theory, that brings it together. One of our friends laments about this. But, but, but the point is that, that it's the inability of the sciences to engage with these, with these new and emerging problems and learn from them that seems to be at the root, root cause. So I'll just wind up with this last slide of mine, that the crucial differences evident from from, or from these two cases of living soils that we've seen, which have addressed, which have tried to or claimed to address living soils as a crucial problem, is one, that living soils are actually a public good. This is actually something that, not comes, that doesn't come from me, but from Professor Abhijit Sen, who was chairing our session, or who was a keynote address giver at, at our conference. And he clearly explained how public goods and publicness are things that are not understood very well, not in ca capitalist regimes or in communist regimes, so we need to find a way of getting to an ecological understanding of public goods as we take what is a public good or what is an ecological good that is a public good right now in this room, the air that we breathe. Yeah? So we take it for granted that somebody is giving us good air. Yeah? So if, if ecological goods are public goods and we have a responsibility to those public goods, then we have to find the ways in which, find some ways in which the sciences and society together will engage with these public goods. So the crucial difference was that our report, that is our little report that we gave to the ministry, which is still in the process, um, engaged with this idea of soils as public goods and the responsibility of the state as a trustee to take care of these public goods. Hell, these because again, soil is divided into different small plots as individuals as we own it or as farmers, but the, the point is that we can't afford to do that. If I ill-treat my child, the state has a responsibility to take the child and put it in a foster home, right? Soils are like that. 
soils. Anybody who abuses soils must lose the soil or the land, give it to the state or another caretaker, and have a system where the soil is brought back to life. In other words, it is a responsibility to the world in general that we owe in taking care of soils. The last point that I have is that there is a different definition of soils as a set of, well, all these features that I've listed here, but with the local capacities for inclusion, anticipation, responsibility, and accountability. In other words, we're talking about local actors who cannot work without good sciences and good data. Yeah? In England, we, say, we see now that every county has a local environmental records unit. And who are the, who are the data keepers and, and the data registry ent entry people? The local citizens. Every citizen is an owner of the data. The Thames Valley Environmental Records Center, which, whose presentation is what I heard last year, and I've been following their works ever since, has the environmental data entered by individual citizens. I mean, I've found a difference in fig, uh, egg-laying be behavior of finches, or there's a new laundromat that, that's, that, that is letting its water out into the Thames. Yeah? So there is report that there's, each of these reports is entered, classified, and processed by a group of, well, digitally equipped data entry people, scientists who can interpret these, and again, policymakers who en engage with this data on a weekly basis. What are the local changes? In other words, we need decentralized knowledge systems with integration of different knowledge actors at the policy, practice, and science level. Um, that is, nature of, and role of knowledge has to be different, and this is something that, that somehow this international assessment seems to have forgotten. IPBES stands for International Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform. Can you, can you tell me what a platform means? Anybody? Come on. What is a platform? It's an equal space, right? In other words, scientists and policy makers are meant to participate in that platform equally. So why is Sir Robert Watson crying about scientists squabbling and how can I take this report to policymakers? He should have ideally had the policymakers on the panel, right? He should have inv involved the governments, that is intergovernmental bodies, from different governments to be part of the panel and to work with the scientists who are coming up with the evidence, argue this out, whether they are from the third world or the first world, it doesn't matter, but be part, be part of this group. So this was actually one of the major, major achievements that we've had in our tiny little experiment. Again, I'm begging for more of these experiments to happen in this world, in our world here, especially in India, because we are capable of this, unlike many other countries. We are capable of a decent dialogue between actors, even today. And keeping that dialogue alive, that is learning together, is what we've done. Learning together as a group of actors interested in a particular problem is what we've done. Um, but again, what we also achieved, which is again a, a small experiment, but what we've also achieved is, is, that, um, is, is a slight shift, maybe not a complete shift, a slight shift of those scientists involved from thinking about themselves as scientists who are speaking truth to power. Remember Robert Watson's sadness is that people squabbling, scientists squabbling amongst themselves, I can't take it to the policymakers, meaning you can't take it upwards, right? As scientists speaking truth to power, that model has changed in our little experiment to a model where scientists, practitioners, and policymakers trying to make sense of the world together, trying to draw different criteria, trying to address different scales. We're no longer talking about a national policy for soils. We're talking about small block-level pilots. We're talking about an engagement of a different sort at the local level. We're talking about different data systems. In other words, we're bringing more science into the game, but more science is tempered with and is engaging actively, proactively, with social and, and political systems. So um, I'll stop with that. That's my last slide. Thank you very much. Oh, OK. Thank you for the fan. That was very good. I was sweating. Thank you. See, in the beginning part, you talked about uh, policy happening in Delhi state, doing things, and so on. And it looks like that the whole idea of uh, policies of green revolution and degradation of uh, soil and other things it's led to was kind of state state sponsored state did it 
And later on, you want state to control individual farmers and stop them from degrading the soil and so on and so forth. But the major actor which seems to have led to uh, what the situation we are talking about seems to be state. And how do you expect the state to suddenly transform into a state which will actually begin uh, conserving the soil and punishing the individual farmer and taking soil, uh, soil away from him and so on. Whereas it appears that the primary agent for the cause of the problem has been the state. Great. Can I take that? So, um, yes, but then uh, we, we, we're not talking about the state taking away the soil, but the state being, well, let's say, if the nature of the state is one that is in my background, in other words, in my backyard, my gram panchayats or my, my block level actors, then the nature of the state is completely different. I'm not asking for, well, let's say a set of maybe three policymakers in Delhi who would decide the Green Revolution. I mean, you look at the history of the Green Revolution, it's actually three people. Yeah? So if, if it's three people at the national level who decide the fate of my land, like it happened in the 1960s, then it's a completely different story. But if it's, let's say, about, about 30, 30 actors in some local block who, with whom I can talk, and if we have, in other words, what does that build? That builds a state that is, again, responsible, accountable, and monitoring you. That is, that is, there is an inclusion and anticipation involved in that, that they know, well, here's this guy's land, or here's her land that's, that's being well, used for various other purposes, that's degrading, or toxins are accumulating, or whatever. So the nature of the state is different when it is decentralized, when there is dialogue. In other words, the policymaker himself or herself is a different actor when you have a decentralized engagement compared to the central national policymaker that we're talking about. Yeah, so, so we, I suppose. We are assuming that the state will dramatically transform. There are, there are transformations that are happening, whether we notice or not, right here in, in Karnataka. I mean, I think it was Belgaum that said that we will, have, we will build local food sheds. Yeah? The municipal corporation says this. I don't know if it, succeed, if it will succeed or if it's actually taking off. Or, but then these are things that are coming out of the state, coming out of state bodies, civic bodies. These are statements that are coming through Shur, for instance, as district in Kerala says that we will become an organic district. The, the state of Andhra, for instance, is the biggest example that we have. Zero-based natural farming, zero-budget natural farming that's been launched. Vijay Kumarji, who was heading the MKSS in, um, in, in the union government, is now heading this program in, uh, in Andhra. That's a big, big change. I mean, it's asking for a sea change in Andhra's, well, agricultural policy, land policy, water policy, biodiversity policy. In other words, he says, well, this will, but this will all change at the block level. Don't worry. Yeah, this will all, all these changes will happen from the block level and build up to the state level. The same with Orissa's. Orissa state has a millets mission, which is now expanded to some 57 blocks. Yeah? Now, what is, what is the difference? The difference is that this is happening at the block level. People are changing. The block level administration is being given different kinds of diktats. It's, it's not happening without difficulty, Arvind. I completely agree. The transformation is happening with great pain. Some of these block level officers are saying, but how do I do this? Yeah? So there is a machinery working with them. I mean, one of these partners that I showed in this, in, in this, in this dialogue, um, I just like to open, can I open this again? Okay, um, in this, um, sorry, I'll just get back to my original slide. So this, that is the revitalization of Rain for Agriculture Network, uh, the Network on Rural and Agrarian Studies, which is actually was born in, in Bangalore at Nias uh, when Vasavi was there. Um, and we hold meetings every, every once in two years or 18 months in small towns in India involving about 40 students who will all be together with this group of experts and work with them. Um, the Indian Society of Agroecology, VASAN, Watershed Support Network in Andhra. VASAN is working very closely with both the Andhra government and the, and the Orissa government in both these experiments. It is painful, but it is happening. Okay. Let me just try once more if uh, there are sure. questions from the student audience. Are there? If not, the professor will speak. See, the role of state, it's sometimes so negative. I don't know it's purposeful, but you take example of what happens in Mysore. I live in Mysore. Every year, there is a problem about Kaveri water between Tamil Nadu and Karnataka. Yes. Fortunately, not this year. This year, people are fed up of water. Everywhere, there's enough. <laughs> Otherwise, every year we have this problem. Yes. And see, I have been watching this. I was a part of that movement also. I am a farmer from Punjab, so I know the farmers' problems. You know, the farmers of Mysore, Mandya, Chamarajnagar from this side, and the farmers from Salem, from Erode, from Tirchirapalli, from Dindigal, from Karur, and all those areas, several times they have taken up this initiative. 
that the farmers of two states will sit together, Kaveri Basin farmers, and they try to work out something. If there is a shortage of water one year, these districts will have the crop. Next year, the other districts will have the crop. Others say, work out some formula. I have, we have been seeing that the state not only has not encouraged, the state has been discouraging this both yes. states. Not yes. only Karnataka and Tamil Nadu. Because yeah. they win and lose elections on the basis of the recovery issue. Yeah. So the state, most of the times, what you see is, see, we have, it's not that science is new now. We have had enough science, agriculture science, for the past 70 years in this country. We have enough number of policies. So many policies have been framed, but nothing works. Yeah. Why the things don't work? That is the important thing now to think about, is that we don't have actually dearth of laws, we don't have dearth of policies, and we have enough science already. But yep. how to make the things work is, is, uh, is important. Yep. Um, yes, please. Actually, sort of two, two quick clarifications. So, you, you know, you've been talking about the nature of the state, and I think uh, along the lines of what Meva is, uh, was asking, um, is there in anything intrinsic to the nature of the state that makes it take a certain position which is, which is not helpful in this context? Um, um, and the other thing is, you know, you said something about science not learning. Um, I guess by that you mean that certain sort of facts that are clear and visible have not been acknowledged by the scientific literature in this. Is that what you mean? Or are you sort of saying that they haven't taken action on the basis of those? No, I, I guess taking action on the basis of those, that is the last part of your question, is something that has to be left to other people too. That is, it's not, scientists can only suggest options for action, and it's the responsibility of society and the economy, and especially policymakers, to take it up and work on it. But why the state doesn't work on these lines, that is, in lines that are eco-friendly, is also a part of a much larger economic framing. That is, remember I spoke about the, the framing question, that is, that is, there are two different frameworks. So if, if the state exists in the knowledge, or let's say if the state is working on public policy in a framework which says that the economy is at the center, that is cultivation of rice or cultivation itself as an economic activity is at the center, and resources, and again, social actors who are dependent on these resources are two of these well, outer circles from which you can draw endlessly and you can dump endlessly the waste or whatever, conflicts, all the outcomes that can happen, then that model has a limitation. However many policies you have, you will finally face the ecological crunch on an year where the rainfall is less or in an year where, where the Kaveri Delta and the upper reaches of the, of the river where, where there is other crops being cultivated will face consequences. There will be, well, questions that will be reflected in the economy. In other words, the economy will readjust. That is, the state will either appease somebody with a larger subsidy, waive loans. What are these loan waivers? These are all accumulated costs that, that have been incurred because certain ecological functions that agriculture performs. Agriculture, when it originated, was never about producing one output or yield. It was always seen as a multifunctional sector. Now, it's not that anymore. It's always seen, it was always seen as a primary sector, which is why, again, the state has its interests, because agriculture is no longer a primary sector. It's not a primary producer. It's a primary producer only so far it is, as it uses sunlight. Otherwise, it is a sector that's sandwiched between two major industrial sectors. So we have to see where the inputs come from. Why is, it, why is the state interested in, in this Tanjavur Delta? What was the, the cost for this, the, the, the first, one of the first struggles in Tanjavur where about 40 laborers were burnt alive? Now these are all questions that, that, that we need to ask as questions, not just of the state, but about the kind of evidence the state uses to legitimize it. That is where I say the sciences don't learn. That is, if the sciences still continue encouraging the state to supply water, Instead of encouraging the state to invest in soil biomass building, soil moisture retention, these are also good sciences. The evidence does exist. Like you said, there is a lot of scientific evidence out there. Why is it that we use only one part of it? Or why is it that we, that we do not encourage, well, let's say, research on certain kinds of, well, these three M's that we mentioned now, soil microbial activity? You know, Dr. Rupella struggled throughout his life to prove that biomass in different parts of this country have different kinds of composting qualities, and they produce different kinds of biomass, yeah? So unless you have one standard NPK ratio that the state can subsidize biomass with, it will not be subsidized. Is that an answer? 
Now, this, these are the ways in which science can help. That is, sciences have to engage differently. Sciences have to come up with decentralized, again, location-specific, maybe data sets, maybe processes, policy intelligence that the state can use at the local level, not at the national level. So we're asking for a different engagement of the sciences, both in terms of the content of science and also who they work with and who they speak to. Not as speaking truth to power, but as working with the, with the, with the well, local policymakers and making a change. Just respond to that uh, uh, comment. I think one problem that happens with science, and I'm thinking in particular of biological sciences here, uh, I think there's a certain perverse logic about why they tend to favor centralized solutions. And, and that's because there has been a dominant theme running through science, I think we inherited this in biology from physics, which matured a little earlier, which is of universal laws and universal principles governing things. And this got carried on in biology and it's very much a part of mainstream biology uh, today. The one area of biology in which this is not mainstream and which, in which it has actually been given up in favor of a view that scientific laws and principles actually in the living world are very local, not global, is actually the sciences broadly of ecology and evolution, which are completely marginalized within yes. biology anyway. And uh, so if you restore the balance within biology between ecology evolution versus the more uh, unifying reductionist forms of biology, I think part of this problem will tend to go away automatically. Perhaps, yes. Um, that's going to take us to a different discussion. <laughs> so, uh, I think even biology operates on universal principles, despite the diversity you contend with. Based on your uh, data, can you sort of very, very negative projection, how long will it take for our country to lose all soils? Um, well, I, I don't know. I mean, there's, there is, it, again, I'm sorry if it sounded very pessimistic. It's not, actually, because there are lots of experiments. There are hundreds of experiments again, at very local scale. Like I said in, a, in, in one of the slides, there are the scale question that the ministry wanted was about 40,000 farmers or more. So we found many evidences where, where oops, 40,000 farmers or more um, have, that is a scale effect has been achieved, where uh, landscapes have been managed and changed, transformed completely, foundation for ecological security. I've been to, to, to Bilvada in, in, the, in the peak of the drought in 2016 where I walked around and saw wells with water. in Bilwada is notorious as the first district to receive railway line water supply, drinking water. So in that district, there was drinking water, and there was the rule, there was a norm that farmers had, for, that again, formed and fought against the state to keep that norm, that no tubal irrigation will be allowed. So a farmer who had taken a, a, a loan, that is a, a National Horticulture Mission NHM project to cultivate roses in Bilwada, had to return the money, 10 lakhs money, to, back to the, to, the, to the government because the other farmers sat around in the house. Like they said, mashal leke bait ke raat bhar. You know, we just waited there. Now, there are hundreds of experiments in this country like this where local rules and norms, because they know that tube well irrigation is not meant for that region. Like, Maharashtra, parts of Maharashtra, Latur, for instance, which got three times as much rain that year as Bhilwara did, had a massive drought. There were people standing in queues all along the roads. But Bhilwara had drinking water just because of this norm. So there are many experiments of this sort, water, soil, biodiversity, where communities are taking up responsibility and working with, again, not alone. There are good sciences involved with them too. FES and scientists there do work with, their, with, with local communities to monitor, to record this data, to, to show them what foraging practices are that are most fruitful. There's lots of evidence available. So I hope not all our soil will not be lost. All right.
Pedological features, but there are some pedological features which are very difficult to assess. Style itself will have different things. That function is not totally studied much of it with respect to the crop response. Thank you for mentioning pedology. Pedology is one of the su nine sub-disciplines of Indian yeah. soil science research, which gets 5% of the research <laughs> publications and maybe even less money. I've, I've counted only the publications. 52% comes from manurial trials. You can imagine why. Yeah? So, there, is, so there, there are different sub-disciplines of soil sciences which are needed, desperately needed. Dr. D.K. Pal, who's done some of the pioneering work in, in pedology, has also just published a, book, a, a, a paper and also a book on, on the soil carbon status of India's soils. Brilliant paper, PNAS publication. But, well, nobody reads them. Yeah? Sorry. Okay. Um. Sorry? The, the, the that is in layers, different structures. That is, when you cut soil transitionally right. like this, what does it Not look change. like? Yeah. What does it mean? OK. Do you okay. <laughs> okay. OK, are there more questions? If not, uh, let's thank, uh, thank Professor Rainer. And uh, let's also thank the earlier speakers, Professor Arvind and uh, Professor Benzai. Uh, thank you all for coming. And uh, thanks to RRI for hosting this event.